So my teacher used to tell us this that uh, when you're solving a question, don't worry about how will you write it in coding. Just think about if this was given to me as a human and I had to solve it. Yes, you have to keep yourself up to date with the industry, otherwise the industry will kick you out. Soft skills definitely they do help in HR rounds. Many of my friends they do uh, have complained is that all went all rounds went good. Only in the HR round uh, I was I was fumbling in that uh, answering in that question and. Uh, Somehow I missed it. Somehow I, I missed that opportunity. One thing, don't lie on your resume. <laughs> uh, the projects which I've written, you should be actually knowing in and out of those projects. They will grill you on those projects. They will uh, question you on the decisions you have made. Why did do this and why not do this? Because people who are taking interviews on the other end, who are sitting on that side of the table, they're really experienced. Welcome back to our YouTube channel. Today we have Amandeep with us. He is currently working as a software engineer in LinkedIn. Uh, he'll be sharing about his journey so far and uh, will be sharing few tips and strategies with all the freshers out there who want to start their tech journey soon and want to enter the uh, coding industry as soon as possible. Okay, so hi Amandeep. Thank you for being with us here. Uh, so tell, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you started your entire journey and how you ended up landing the LinkedIn job. Yeah. Hi Shivani. Hello everyone. Uh, thanks for inviting me here. Uh, as Shivani said, my name is Amandeep Singh and uh, I'm currently working in LinkedIn uh, in the content moderation world. So uh, I started my journey as a PayPal intern and uh, I got that opportunity from my uh, college, which is VIT Willow. So I uh, cracked the internship through uh, campus placement. And uh, I worked in the security team in uh, PayPal. Um, after completing my internship, I was offered a full-time uh, position in PayPal itself in the uh, Java Frameworks team. So uh, I, I stayed there for around one and a half years. And then when I uh, was, uh, you can say, uh, done with my knowledge, my part of knowledge in the Java world, uh, I wanted to go more towards the customer facing teams or try something else. And that is where I uh, applied as a software engineer position on LinkedIn. And uh, fortunately, I got selected. So that's my span from starting as an intern to joining LinkedIn as a software engineer. Okay. Uh, that's great, Aman. So uh, you took uh, computer science in college as well, right? So you were always a computer science student and uh, you started coding from the first year itself or was it something uh, which you started a little bit later into your college journey? So uh, this thing is, uh, I actually want to give the entire credit to my um, to my uh, computer uh, sir who was there in school. So my, I'm from ICSC board and uh, our coding uh, starts way early. Uh, like I remember me coding in class six and seven. So uh, seventh was uh, C plus plus basics, and then starting from Java. And fortunately, I had a very very good teacher. He used to just uh, spark us with, "Oh, you you will just do it. Uh, do do some tough problems." We were solving uh, chain reaction questions in class 11, 12. So uh, those type of games we were developing in Java, I remember, and uh, we aced uh, those because of my teacher. So I always had that passion of coding right from my school. And that is the reason I always uh, thought that I'll go into the software engineering domain, which uh, like where you get to play around with coding, develop new features, develop new projects with coding. So my history goes really back in coding. And uh, in college, yes, uh, again, I had that love for Java. So I uh, continued my learning in Java, developed more projects, started, uh, entered into the web development domain, uh, HTML, CSS basics, and then back end again in Java and PHP. So yes, the coding goes way back. I always had that heart for being an engineer or especially a software developer engineer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in your case, you were always uh, interested in coding and always had the passion to pursue your career into it, uh, right? But there are students out there who take computer science in college and uh, they are not really serious about it. Some have the issue that, you know, colleges are not that maybe great. They don't teach that well or they don't have that kind of exposure where they can be you know fully immersed into that coding environment so that they can thrive in it right so do you have any sort of uh, you know advice or strategy to share with such students who are just starting out who are in their college and they have that some sort of you know inclination towards having a career in coding but they don't know what exactly is the right path to choose you know what resources they can use so if you can share those strategies and resources with us that would be great sure um... 
I had a few friends over from this background that uh, when even though they had joined uh, CSIT in college, but they had never done coding before. Then they were from the physical education background. They had taken that as a subject in class 12th. Uh, and uh, it was just out of, maybe you can say, rush or family pressures, or even just like their own uh, thinking that, yes, they want to become an engineer, but they have not done coding before. Mm -hmm. I have had that friends. And uh, it is very normal to uh, feel that uh, pressure when you first start coding. First right. advice, which I will give to almost everyone is that if you do not find love for that uh, particular thing, be it coding, be it any stream you're choosing, uh, you may not uh, do very well in it because it's with your heart that you actually kind of start liking something, right? So when you're doing um, coding, the main thing that you should like is problem solving. That if an interesting question comes to your head, do you just leave it after trying for a half an hour or do you persist that even when you are uh, drinking your tea in the evening, if something is going on in the back of your head that yes, what would be the solution of that? Do you have that problem solving uh, capability? If you have problem solving capability, then yes, um, maybe you have landed the correct way that you are into CSID. Now comes to the part that how do you start coding and how do you start learning about the basics of coding, right? So uh, I would say start from the scratch. Start from just the basic syntaxes of what uh, so my teacher used to tell us this, that uh, when you're solving a question, don't worry about how will you write it in coding. Just think about if this was given to me as a human and I had to solve it, what were the steps I would do it? And then all you have to do is map those steps to a programming syntax, be it C language, be it uh, Java you're using, right? So then comes the point of basically dividing into different uh, phases. First phase could be just developing that concept, whether you're able to map of how a human would do it and how I would write in flowchart concepts of how I would do this program. Don't go and write the program. Second would be learn the basics of the language. If you're using Java, if you're using C++, do some basic research. Start learning that language through online YouTube videos or any uh, channels. There are a lot of abundant channels teaching these things like today. Learn syntax and then start solving and then start actually mapping that flowchart in your head to actual coding syntax. So this way, you would start from very basic questions, maybe printing patterns, but uh, someday you will get into the concepts of actually doing and developing something which you will love. Got it. Strikes in, right? That is where you will start with that knack of, okay, I have to do 10 problems each day. I have got this. I am loving this one. Yes. So I think what you're saying is that uh, anyone who wants to have a career in it, uh, first, they need to have that problem solving mindset, right? And second, they have to be very persistent at it. They have to do questions daily, a uh, set amount of questions daily so that they actually get better at it every day. They solve new questions, right? Uh, that's a fair advice, I think, Aman. Uh, cool. So uh, let's talk a little bit about your uh, you know, internship experience, which you had in PayPal, I guess. Uh, right. So you got this internship in which year of college? So um, usually companies come during your fourth year, first semester. So okay. uh, that is when the companies come in and the internship starts from the fourth year, second semester. So okay. the entire second semester, either you choose a project. If you've already got an internship, you can go to the internship and mark that as your uh, final year project. Great, great. So apart from PayPal, did you have any other options in your bucket as well? Or was it the only choice that you had? So um, I got selected in two companies. Uh, one was Amazon and one was uh, PayPal. So okay. both were offering me an internship uh, and uh, I went ahead with PayPal. Okay, so what was the reason behind choosing PayPal? Because I'm sure a lot of the students, you know, in India, they are aware of Amazon, but not that much about PayPal. I mean, the people uh, are in this industry already, they might be, but not every background person is, right? So Amazon is sort of a dream uh, company for a lot of people. So why would you choose for PayPal over Amazon? Um... I'll, I had a, a lot of things going on in my mind when I was making that decision. It was a tough decision. And uh, I just had half an hour to make that choice because the uh, VIT teachers, they were telling me that in half an hour, you have to give us a sheet of paper, write whatever company you're choosing. But uh, I still remember that day that a lot of things were going on in my head. Uh, Amazon, on the other hand, was taking around 13, 14 interns. And in PayPal, I was the only intern selected. So... Just by doing a very basic math, I was able to understand that the chances or the probability of actually converting myself and proving myself in PayPal were way higher than whatever Amazon was doing because it was hiring 16, 17 people from the entire in which 13 were interns, four were full-time employees, right? So that was the first level math which I did. And second, uh, I should not be saying this, but uh, I had heard different work-life balance stories from Amazon in which my seniors had advised me that 
as a company amazon likes to uh, do challenge you with more difficult situations basically in polite words the work life balance is not that great and in the initial years of my career in which i was just going out of college uh, because i had already worked a lot of I, i had worked hard in college i had done my part of it so the first 2 3 years i wanted to stay in a company which is uh, letting me uh, have a good work life balance uh, i'm learning there uh, i'm developing something out of the box and paypal was uh, clicking all these check options plus i had a wonderful time in paypal's uh, interview experiences the people who were the directors who had come to take interviews they were telling me about what paypal does how they do it and i, I really you could connect with the uh, company's problem statement at that point of time so these were the few decisions which made me uh, choose paypal over amazon okay so did you get the uh, ppo from paypal after your internship ended yes so uh, i got uh, uh, the pre placement offer from paypal after my internship but uh, i had got it in a different team so my team which i was interned with was a security team it okay. used to develop products around how to uh, make paypal more secure uh, more secure apis more secure backend and uh, more secure against hackers but uh, once i completed my internship the same team did not have a vacancy so they transferred me to a new team which was a java frameworks team so i spent a good one and a half years learning how to uh, build java frameworks from scratch and uh, how to uh, develop technology over it so that the entire paypal backend could work so we were responsible for almost 3500 applications in paypal that one thing you break in a few minutes 3500 applications break so it was a good experience even in that thing okay that is awesome to hear amni this uh, question is for people only uh, you know who are looking for internship opportunities so paypal came to your cal- college for this offer but there are a lot of people who are trying for good internships off campus as well right so maybe you can uh, uh, share a little bit about what was the entire you know selection criteria was for paypal even if it comes to you know off- on campus and even if people are applying to off campus what all uh, sorts of things should they take care of like do you think cgpa plays a role uh, and to what extent does it play a role and what kind of projects should students start building already when they are even in college so that they are able to crack such uh, good internships um i'll take this question in like parts first part which i would like to cover is regarding the off campus and the on campus thing on campus if people are visiting your campus there is nothing better than that you can definitely go in and um like up sit in paypal interviews uh, they usually do ask a good uh, he- uh, hard level questions in uh, dsa but uh, if you already are preparing for a good uh, be on product based a super dream company right so you can always uh, expect that you will be grilled upon dsa so off campus i think just after my batch because covid came uh, paypal and many other uh, dream companies they started this uh, all india challenges so do look out for that Mm-hmm. Right to company pages. See if they are hosting an all India challenge in which you can prove and enter directly through an off campus drive. So this is way they are connecting it. Uh, there are a lot of companies specially targeting women uh, engineers. So women drives are conducted uh, for special hirings. And uh, please do make a good uh, use of those opportunities if you are hiring. If you are trying for an off campus opportunity. And uh, regarding uh, the. preparation uh, i think it that was the second question right yeah so uh, regarding preparation uh, yes uh, you will need to prepare uh, in depth uh, about dsa uh, these companies will give you uh, first few rounds of online assessments in which uh, it would be mostly on hacker rank or hacker alert in which you will be asked three or four coding questions one one and a half hours of time and you have to ace uh, those questions so that you can be selected So if I have to talk about my experience, five uh, hundred students from VIT they sat in the PayPal interview, and uh, I think uh, around eleven were shortlisted for the. Five hundred only eleven were shortlisted. Shortlisted. So that that kind of questions they will ask, and uh, they will expect you to solve in very less amount of time the maximum number of uh, test cases you can cover. So they were we were given just two questions. I still remember, and uh, none of them were able to do the entire two questions. Uh, the second question was that hard that the more number of test cases you do, the higher your chances are for selection. And I remember eleven students getting selected, and out of that, four getting uh, chosen for final uh, like uh, like internships as well as full time roles. But you can expect uh, hard questions because these companies, when they are uh, targeting engineers, hiring engineers for their uh, company, they want to understand till what level is your problem solving capacity. how much time you have actually spent 
uh, in your college life thinking about these concepts, how much good projects you have made. So all this does come under uh, the criteria. And it, if, it, if it is a college placement, yes, CGPA does matter. Off campus, I'm not sure, but there is definitely a minimum benchmark of around six or some CGPA. But college, my college, they had put a hard limit of some 7.8 or 8 CGPA, right? That's how colleges will also put their uh, CGPA uh, benchmark so that they can have minimum people getting selected. But still, uh, VIT being abundant in numbers, <laughs> 500 were able to qualify that and uh, give for them. I hope I answered the question. Please correct. Uh, Sure, sure. Thank you, uh, Mandeep. Uh, let's move on to the next question. Uh, one thing I would like to understand from your end uh, is that, like you mentioned, CGPA is definitely a criteria for these companies and they're hiring even if they're off campus or on campus. And uh, so a lot of the students out there when they're still in college, they're confused uh, whether CGPA is the only criteria, whether they should start building projects, start co contributing to open source projects or uh, they should just completely focus on the you know subjects that they have in college so what kind of what what would be the best mixture a student can maintain so that he is also able to you know perform well in the uh, traditional sense of it and also able to crack a good company because with uh, you know in, industry is changing really fast and they keep on bringing new technologies every now and then so it's really difficult for anyone who's just starting to keep up with it right so how much uh, of a difference will it make if we just you know continue focusing on the uh, college subjects or maybe just do uh, very basic projects. Do you think it makes a lot of difference if you make really good projects? So um, I'll start with that line that, yes, you have to keep yourself up to date with the industry. Otherwise, the industry will kick you out. That's the harsh reality of today that uh, every engineer or every person who's working in the industry, they have to make themselves up to date. Uh, industry does not like to carry backlog with it industry just tries to throw away the backlog that's the part right but uh, if you are uh, a fresher and you are focusing on entering into these companies there are different uh, areas you have to actually work around people just uh, i have usually seen many uh, influencers they just talk about that do dsa and you'll be okay with it but uh, at least i personally this is my opinion that uh, your resume should be uh, having some of everything because as a uh, individual who are who is just out, out of college right they're exploring areas you might not know how good you can be in dsa or how much good innovative ideas you can bring just right into projects right so do dwell into all these areas i know uh, every student complains that the time is less and the things to do is really more but college is actually the life to just give it the hard push right uh sacrifice okay. some, sacrifice some sleep if i'm uh, i i can be actually uh uh, ridiculed on this but uh sacrifice some sleep uh push yourself to your limits and uh see if you can do some night projects some group projects in which your entire group is contributing you are acting as a backend engineer your friend is acting as a front-end engineer do some collaborative projects you will learn more in that areas uh do practice a lot of tsa uh utilize your weekends in weekends usually uh people would like to have fun but i would say that spend some of it your time in weekends just doing something out of the box it could be even open source uh attending hackathons all these things does add that spark to your resume that when a company is shortlisting you even off campus the chances of you getting selected above other candidates because it's a neck-to-neck -neck fight right everybody's preparing dsa how would a company uh, rate people who are exactly uh masters in dsa on the exact level then is when they will get to projects if you have good projects then they will let go to your hackathons or your prizes right so don't leave that chance i would say do your best and uh, take out or carve out that time for almost everything and your resume should be the best of all and uh, yes that's my advice okay. uh that's great advice Amin. so uh what we can uh basically take out from this point is that everyone needs to have something of everything in their uh, you know whole preparation they have to have a good resume they have to have some good projects in their resume and practicing a bunch of dsa questions are not just enough they have to uh, stand out in the crowd so they'll be doing a lot of other things as well uh, right so that's great uh, apart from this amandeep uh, we have covered i think uh, the interview part the projects part and everything do you think uh, soft skills play a role in you know people getting selected for great roles in engineering like People can uh, get really good at solving coding questions, building logic. Uh, they can clear the technical rounds. But when it comes to clearing the HR round, how big of a role does it play to have really good soft skills when it comes to clearing these you know, big companies? Um, 
actually uh, as college graduates we do not really give importance to soft skills but i realized it as a hard way that when you're giving uh, hr interview rounds the rounds are not just for fun they are trying to assess whether you are a good fit a good culture fit for their company or not okay. so many hrs will ask you questions around your uh, like situations in which if you get into a fight with your uh, colleague what will you do if you have a disagreement between you and your manager how would you deal with these situations and college graduates are just not ready for it not everybody is ready for it i would say start thinking on those lines because in college we can uh, talk to each other as friends we can resolve things out but uh, in a professional world things are really different you need to know how professional world works and uh, somehow the industry is expecting that even freshers should know this it should not be the case freshers should come in the industry and then learn these things but okay. somehow they are expecting that the freshers should know all these things so i would suggest that start reading interview experiences see how others have answered this question and what is the actual answer the hr is expecting it's not bad to prepare early you can go and search for the most asked hr questions prepare yourself in that way because this is your learning stage i'm not saying that you already know that you may not even know what to do when you know have a disagreement with your colleague right but maybe reading that answer develops that thing in you and you start practicing practicing that in your real life so that is how i take it that soft skills definitely they do help in hr rounds many of my friends they do uh, have complained this that all when all rounds went good only in the hr round uh, i was i was fumbling in that uh, answering in that question and uh, somehow i missed it somehow i, I missed that opportunity so uh, if you are preparing so hard on your tech skills spend at least an hour or half an hour uh, reading some past interview experiences reading some hr questions so that you don't even miss that one opportunity which is the last uh, round in most of the interviews right so do prepare for soft skills as well yes there yes, yeah i think because uh, we think that we will be able to answer it easily because they are not, how hard are they going to be but then these are such hypothetical situations that we have never thought about plus can you just tell me this like do they expect you to give that sort of diplomatic answers wherein you sound also nice and you know but or do they look for honesty as well in those answers okay so uh, i'll not in the company but uh, i did sit for a company in uh, vit and uh, i went till the hr round the hr round hr asked me that uh, where do your parents live i was as like my parents live in kanpur and she was like uh, would you uh, love to travel to kanpur often to meet your parents and uh, i gave an honest answer that yes i would like to visit them at least once in a quarter so that uh, i do have that special bond with the parents i would like to visit them once a quarter and uh, at that time she laughed and she was like how is that practically possible that every quarter you traveling to uh, your hometown but uh, now i know that why i was not selected after that around for the okay. final round, you know because yes uh, the company is uh, expecting a diplomatic answer from you you may travel every quarter but you don't have to just tell them uh, right away in, in the hr round you have to give a diplomatic answer that yes the work is priority many hrs are way old they are not in the 21st century they are expecting answers which the older hrs are expecting right that yes you are company focused your company is your first priority your family is your second priority so i'm not saying directly tell them these but you have to sense that heat of the situation when yeah. you're talking to the hr you have to see what kind of answer they're expecting their facial expressions uh, so at such an early age yes it is expected at this early age as a fresher you are expected to sense the energy in the room what the answer what kind of an answer the hr is expecting and this will only come with practice so yeah. there are a lot of opportunities to give mock interviews on these uh, areas i would encourage students to take make use of these uh, top made other uh, company basically sites making you aware of how uh, mock interviews can be done on these areas so that you get taught by what kind of answers you need and then you can learn from the feedbacks as well but yes diplomatic answers they do work and they can also backfire it is all upon the energy of the room of where you are sitting yeah i think um with diplomatic uh, you would also need to see like if you are giving practical answers or not like right. i mean they are just judging you on, on that as well plus if you do a little bit of research about the company from going into that round that would also help like if you can see if the company is like really new all the people are from the similar you know generation so that kind of cultural difference will also be not there and people will sort of uh, you know vibe with you and they will understand where are you coming from but if the company uh, has all kinds of people then you'll have to again prepare for it accordingly that's great 
Cool. I mean, so one thing uh, I would like to understand, you were a ICSC uh, student, right? And like you mentioned, you always had a knack for coding from the beginning. Like you started in uh, school itself. So it was uh, not smoothest, but at least it was an easy ride for you to actually just uh, uh, start having a career here. Uh, but can you just tell me like, uh, uh, like, any any struggles or any problems that you faced even uh, being that person who always had an interest in coding uh, so that if people who are starting now they also feel the similar struggles so they can know what is the right path to choose and if they should continue or not yeah uh, one of my initial struggles was that uh, when you are so engrossed in dsa right people who have done a lot of dsa they know that time is everything in those rounds so what you would tend to do is you just you just try to make it work you just try to have all those green check marks on the test cases irrespective of whatever code quality you have written mm -hmm. and that is now how the industry works so when you will land your internship and you will go and write your code maybe your first pr just gets totally rejected why because uh in coding in industry you are expected to write production ready code you are expected to write clean code so what i did in my internship in the initial uh, days itself, I was suggested by my mentor uh, that do read about this because even she knew that college students don't exactly know how much clean code or how much uh, production ready code is the company expecting in the PRs, right? So what I will suggest is that I learned it the hard way by reading books and one of the, I admire that person, basically Robert C. Martin, he has written a very, very good, good, good book, uh, Clean Code. So I did read that and uh, that is what was the struggle in initial days that moving away from that DSA oriented approach of writing everything and then uh, breaking those things out, making good functions, making reusable components. And these type of things would be a little context switch between your DSA and how the actual industry works, but they will let you grow in the industry. There is no uh, harm in accepting that, yes, you are really a master on code chef or whatever be it, but when it comes to actual industry coding you may not even know uh, the basics of it so everybody is here to learn i would suggest that whoever is facing these problems at least i faced it uh, try reading books try referring to older code which is written on the same repository you're working with so these type of learnings will definitely let you grow more but one thing which i've learned hard way is that uh, Reading helps you really a lot. Okay, got it. So, Amandi, apart from clean code, any other book you would like to suggest to newbies out there? Uh, so, one book which can really, which really helped me in my interview preparation and uh, in this DSA uh, was the uh, the basically uh, what was that uh, book? It is regarding the top uh, coding questions which I've answered. Uh, I'm not getting it off of my head, but I'll definitely circle it back to you. So no. I usually recommend my mentees to follow uh, that book. And uh, it is the top 100 questions asked in software industry in coding interviews. Okay. And uh, that I had bought from Amazon. And uh, I had read it during my initial years when I was preparing for uh, interviews. So that is one book. Another book is uh, Data Structures and Algorithms. Uh, it is a really good book of a person who is trying to really engross himself into the uh, depths of DSA. You will learn a lot. You will learn, for example, the code, the uh, book is not something which you will just learn in just one read. People do multiple reads of that uh, book and uh, they uh, get. So I do remember that name now. So the name of the book, which was like, Cracking the Coding Interview. Maybe yeah, quite a famous book, I think. I've heard so about it. Yeah. Cracking the Coding Interview is what I bought from uh, Amazon for my preparation. And uh, it has really a good it's a book which does not teach you uh the way uh you answer the question but how to let the other person explain your answer so basically there is a think aloud approach and uh, you need to follow that during interview because you have to consider that the other person is expecting you to make him understand the solution you just solving it on a pen of pen paper and then making all the test cases work is not how it works in an interview you should be a good orator when you are explaining your solution in simple words you should be able to make the other person understand that right and that is what the that book taught me so that is another book which i would recommend that's a great input from the book, Amandeep. Uh, we'll just put the link to both the books uh, down in the description below so that anyone who's starting with their journey and also wants to read it can uh, read it. 
Uh, cool. So let's move to the next part uh, here. So now that you're currently working in LinkedIn, can you like tell us a little bit about that experience? Like because LinkedIn is obviously uh, again a big deal for a lot of people out there. Can you tell us like how did you get in? And because it was your second job, right? Right, right after PayPal, you joined LinkedIn. So tell us a little bit about the interview experience you had uh, in LinkedIn. Sure. Um, LinkedIn was hiring uh, full stack developers uh, for uh, some teams, and I applied in late uh 2021 and uh i think around uh september october somewhere near that you applied on their website or how did you apply i applied on linkedin as well <laughs> on linkedin you applied through linkedin i applied i was uh i have always been uh very active on linkedin i do like to uh, read and scroll through my linkedin feed i was always impressed by linkedin and uh because linkedin had an opening uh i applied through linkedin itself uh but um uh fortunately i got a call uh i was shortlisted for the interviews and linkedin does uh conduct uh i think four or five rounds of interviews depending upon how for which role they are assigning in so my interview experience at linkedin started with because it was a full stack role it started with the ui round being the first round so i was asked questions around javascript uh questions around ui technologies and uh mostly on the front end uh part of it and uh, that is where uh, JavaScript questions were actually grilled. You should know uh, detailed JavaScript concepts to get into uh, that round because uh, the person is expecting you, if you are an exper experienced person like I was, if you're a freshman, maybe they'll treat you differently. But if you're already worked in the industry for the past some years, they will expect you to know more uh, concepts which the industry usually uses in production code, right? So that is what I was asked. Second round was uh, the problem solving round. So that was a DSA round of it in which they will ask you a few DSA questions and they will expect you to write clean uh, production ready code. So just uh, a production ready code in LinkedIn won't work because they are also expecting, if you are not a fresher, they're expecting that when you are uh, giving this interview, you already have worked in the industry, so you know how to break down your problem. So they'll give a big problem, you have to solve that problem. So make sure you break that down, explain that problem in a better way. So the expectations are even higher when you're already working and then you're Correct. applying. Okay. Correct. So that was the second round. Third round was uh, high level design. So because again, you're not a fresher, you will be expected to know how a system design works. So starting from all the components, starting from uh, databases, uh, service layer, API layer, front end layer, every layer you have to explain how, which all APIs you will make in detail. They will ask you, okay, how much would be the response time of this API if you're putting it for like 10 members or something like that, right? So you should already know all these at the top of your head if you're an experienced person. But if even if you're not experienced and you're a fresher, I would highly re recommend you guys reading about system design because that way you will also learn that if at all you are expected to answer these type of questions during even your HR interview, sometimes the hiring manager rounds do tend to give you a very small design problem and they expect you that even as a fresher, what will you do in those rounds, right? They will usually give you the URL shortener design problem that if you have to design a URL shortener. But uh, that was the third round. And uh, fourth round was the project sharing round. This round is really uh, important even for freshers as well as for uh, experienced folks that uh, they will read the projects which you have written on your resume. So one thing, don't lie on your resume. <laughs> uh, the projects which you have written, you should be actually knowing in and out of those projects. They will grill you on those projects. They will uh, question you on the decisions you have made. Why did do this and why not do this because people who are taking interviews on the other end who are sitting on that side of the table they're really experienced they can actually break that project in and out and they can ask you why did you do this and why not do this uh, even during that one hour so that round is important fifth round was i think uh the hr round in which the hr kind of questions were discussed but that was the overall uh linkedin experience okay so there was there were way too many rounds for you <laughs> yes um, one thing that's good about linkedin is uh linkedin does not judge you based upon your one round many companies have these uh, rounds as elimination rounds but at least what i was told at linkedin is that uh, all your rounds are mandatory they equally matter the, uh, your uh, first round performance will not affect that you're not even going to the second round okay they will, they will make sure that they test you through all your rounds and then they give you a rating whether you should be a higher or not because okay, so they, they would have taken your second round irrespective of how you performed in the first right. round Correct. That is what the HR told. 
because that is LinkedIn's policy, if I'm not wrong, but others can correct me. Uh, that is that is what HR told that LinkedIn judges you on all your rounds. You are given a fair chance to compete in all rounds, showcase that maybe you are a, uh, an average in DSA, but you are really good in system design. So that is where you can prove that even though my DSA round did not go that well, I am really good in system design or my system design did not go well, but I'm really good in uh, the JavaScript front end round, which went well, right? So you could be a really good front end pick for them. So that is how LinkedIn decides. Okay, great. Cool. So Amandi, uh, you applied in LinkedIn via LinkedIn only, and now you're working as a software engineer in LinkedIn. So I think you are the best person to answer this question. A uh, lot of the people want to get hired through LinkedIn, right? They apply and then they also ask for reference there, right? But uh, there is, I'm sure, a right strategy to it. Like, how do you actually, uh, you know, ask for a reference on LinkedIn from anyone? So can you maybe share how did you do it? I know that was a very simple process that you followed, but you were already working in PayPal, right? So you were quite aware what you need to do. But again, people who are freshers who have just out of college, how should they do it? What approach they should follow so that there is a higher chance of getting a yes from the from whoever, whoever they're asking reference from? Sure. Um, I usually get these uh, referral emails and I'll uh, be very honest with everyone seeing this video that not everybody has the time to read at all the messages which they are getting in because when you're working in a company you already have the workload you might not get time the entire day of reading those messages but many there are many good people in the industry who specifically carve out time during their weekends to read through messages and i uh, especially like to follow that there are a lot of friends who i follow and i developed this thing that at least on weekends i'll spend one or two hours reading the messages which i've received on linkedin and when you are writing a message on LinkedIn to a referral person, uh, to asking for a referral for a, from a person, right? Uh, make sure that you are not bloating the message. A very big message would be very hard for that person to read because he has already got a plenty of other messages to read. He would not want to read your uh, yeah. comprehension, whatever you have written in that message. Beating around the bush will not help. Yeah. Just come that straight to the point. Talk straightforward that I'm interested in joining this company. I have got this job uh, opportunity through the careers page, pasting in the link or the job ID. Could you please refer me? I'm attaching my resume or here is a link to my resume. That's it. If they want to refer you, if they want to see your resume, they have the uh, link for it. If they want to see the job ID you want a referral to, you have, the, uh, you have that for. And they would not want to know from which college you are, even that same message, they would not want to know from which uh, part of country you are because they can find all that information in resume and that would not matter for a person who's giving you a referral. A mm -hmm. person who's giving you a referral, they're giving it based out of your resume maybe, or if they uh, have seen you uh, being really active on the platform and your resume stands out that you're really good in DSA. So one, prepare resume good, that if they do the effort of opening your resume uh, link, your resume should just shine out. Uh, things are already bolded. Things are really crisp. Your resume is crisp. Your uh, way of presenting yourself in your resume that yes, you have won these awards or you are a master in courtship. These lines should just stand out because then your chances of getting a referral are more. So make it short, make it crisp, the message, and make sure you are attaching a job ID. Many people do not get the referral because today's companies, they expect a referral to have a job ID. You just can't go to a company portal and say that, hey, HR, I found a really good candidate. Can you please look at them? No, that's not how it works. Yeah. Uh, portal will expect me to write a job ID first. It will search the job which the company has put in for and then make you uh, a, ref a referral, right? So that is one. Many students also have this that they first apply into the portal and then they ask for the referral. Okay. And then they miss out on it because many companies, they say that if the person has already applied, you can't refer them. Oh, so that is like one of the mistakes that a lot of people are making. Of people are making. I, I saw that when, people, when I was in PayPal and many people used to request me, they're like, bro, I've already applied. Can you please give me a review? And the portal used to reject it because portal said that the person's application is already in the database. You can't refer them, right? So how the process works is if you need a referral from your major companies, uh, what you do is you request a referral the person will apply for a referral and then the portal will automatically send you a link to apply so then it is considered the entire full completion of the chain right you asked for a referral i uploaded your resume and your details in the referral portal the referral portal generated a personalized link for you and they sent it on your email saying that hey this person referred you please fill out the application form using the link and 
uh, like uh, submit your content uh, basically for it. So uh, that is where you should actually fill in the application. But it does not work the other way around that first you have sent already submitted the application because many uh, portals of referrals will not let you get referred if you've already applied. So that is one more advice I would like. Okay. Thank you for sharing the entire process of, uh, you know, referring. Uh, I mean, uh, and I'm sure uh, people will find it really helpful. And one thing that they need to take care of while asking for any referral is that they don't need to uh, mention their college again and again. Uh, they just need to worry about the right resume. If they have the right skills, the right projects, I'm sure they'll uh, listen back from the, you know, they'll basically hear back from whoever they're asking the referral from. Great. So one last thing, Amal, I would, uh, you know, and would like to ask you so that we can end it here. Uh, you have gotten into, you know, two of one, two of the best companies out there. People would want to go to. Uh, are you like still continuing with your DSA uh, or have you like stopped giving? Uh, have you like stopped preparing altogether? Like, do you still practice DSA questions or go to platforms, do something, make projects or anything like that? Um, I'll be very honest here. Once you get into the industry, you really lose that uh, uh, contact with DSA, you are more focused on the everyday problems you are doing in, com uh, in your company, the project you're building in your company. But recently I had this opportunity with LinkedIn that I was mentoring a few candidates who had joined from a women uh, hackathon challenge and they were invited as uh, it was called the LinkedIn coaching. So basically okay. 40, 60 students from uh, around the uh, around India were selected for being mentored by LinkedIn uh, software engineers and uh, we mentored them around dsa so there were dsa sessions there were dsa like your mentor would guide you how to prepare for dsa so that has made me again go back to my college days of discussion with them that okay you are not able to solve this question let's solve it together so i have had that uh, experiences just recently so yes uh, i would recommend that when when you are that in love with dsa right especially if you love dsa even after getting into the industry do spend time in it because once you switch hmm. it would be really hard to regain that entire trust back that yes you can learn the entire things but if you are just able to uh, spend half an hour reading about new dsa algorithm or brushing up your dsa skills one week or once in two weeks it would help you when you are trying to switch and that is how uh, my paypal switch uh, from linkedin it was helpful because even though i was in paypal I did not have some very uh, preparing period in which I took some three, four months and I prepared for uh, LinkedIn. It was more about that I was following, uh, I was uh, doing uh, with their Parambalam session with uh, like other mentees on LinkedIn. And I used to teach a bunch of folks DSA. So my DSA skills were brushed up. So people who are already experienced and they're planning to switch, good to prepare it along with your work and not just carve out three, four months before leaving that. That would not help. That would create the pressure. But in this way, taking some time in one, two weeks would really make it easy enough, smooth enough for you to be hands on with TSA. Whenever you're planning to switch, you can just switch without um, worrying about it. Great, great. So I think staying in touch with DSA helps a person a lot because even if you are an experienced person switching, they would again ask you the similar same questions. The rounds are not going to be any different. Your experience will not be enough. Uh, that DSA will always matter. So yeah, so that is, I think, a great advice, Aman. So yeah, that's it. Uh, these are the questions I had in mind. Uh, so we'll just end it here only. Thank you uh, so much, guys, for tuning in. I hope you found it really helpful. Whatever advice Aman had to give, you will definitely apply it in your career so that you can also have a fulfilling coding journey ahead. For more such content, you can just stay to, uh, tuned. We will be bringing you a lot more uh, interesting stories like his and uh, yeah thank you so much for watching